lost task as I get older. Um, so yeah, I want to say welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, just a few words about recording. We are recording, um, but only on speaker view. So I'm not having it on gallery view while we're recording. So you'll all stay um, off camera as it were. Um, if anyone speaks, however, you will go on camera. Um, and when we get to the Q and A at the end, or if there's any any other part where we want contributions from the audience, we'll turn the recording off. Um, and also turn the streaming off. And also, turn, yeah, we're going to turn the streaming off for the Q and A. And there's going to maybe be a little bit of a report back from an exercise they're going to be doing. Um, so John and I met. I think John was towards the end of last year. I can't remember. Um, but I posted something on LinkedIn about my boarding school experience and you commented on it didn't you John mm -hmm. um, and we just thought hey you know maybe something something we'd work on together and we've been planning this since I reckon it's probably November or December but I can't really remember to be honest um and it doesn't really matter does it but what we want to do is kick off with introductions from both of us and so I'm going to tell you my story and then hand over to John so I went to boarding school when I was 11 years old um I, that was in 1969, which is a very, very long time ago. And the world has moved on a lot since then. Um, I was a very shy, sensitive child. Apparently I was autistic, according to my old friend Claire, who's known me since I was about eight years old. Um, and I was very homesick and I cried a lot. And I just wanted to grow up and not be that crybaby anymore. Which is probably the, a kind of a sign of a self-abandonment, which I did not not realise at the time. And later my mother told me that she cried a lot too. She cried herself to sleep every night for about three weeks after I went to school. But she and my dad had this idea, which made sense to them at the time, that because my dad was seriously depressed, it would be better if my sisters and I grew up away from home. And they sent all three of us to boarding school. So the one that I went to was a very Victorian institution. Um, it would qualify as a total institution. They even provided our underwear. <laughs> Time was entirely scheduled. Um, there was very little room for self-expression. I think you maybe had an hour a day when you could do your own thing, but that was quite closely circumscribed as well. Um, there were no counsellors. The pastoral care was shocking. You were at the mercy of your housemistress. And I, we, had, we had three housemistresses in my house in the time I was there, and the middle one, who actually got the sack because she'd thrown a bread knife at one of the girls. Um, her approach to looking after it, a young girl who had recently lost her mother was to let her stew in her own juice. So you can see how entirely lacking in love and affection this was, or compassion. But I wasn't bullied. It wasn't that bad, but I didn't really have any friends. I was a very lonely child. Um, and I was clever, so I retreated into books and homework. And I kind of saw what is called as something to get over. So I had a very passive view that I had been somehow shaped and moulded by boarding school. I had no sense of my own agency in creating what I had become. And I never really understood how it had impacted on my behaviours and adults until about 15 years ago, when a friend of mine called Simon told me about the idea of the boarding school survivor. And he introduced me to Nick Duffel, not literally, but he introduced me to the work of Nick Duffel, who's a psychotherapist who works with boarding school survivors and come up with the idea of the survival personality. Um, so I started to understand that this is a thing, that we can have a survival personality that we create in response to what we've been put through. But I continue to miss the blindingly obvious. For instance, why I had such an overwhelming fear of abandonment, way out of proportion for whatever was going on. I thought it was just a bit quirky. I thought I had, you know, had anxiety, or so did a lot of people. I had a level of independence, which I can now say was entirely dysfunctional. I just thought I was a very independent person. That was a good thing. I didn't realise how that was impacting on my relationships and the fact that up until the current one I'm in now, they were all car crashes. And I didn't realise I had created these programmes and they had kept me safe as a child, but they were not keeping me safe anymore. Um, and now I realise I could create something new very consciously. And so my partner, Mark, talks about dropping out of consciousness into a programme. So when I'm aware and present, I am, I am behaving in a way that I feel, I feel is congruent. When I go into automatic pilot, I drop into the old programs that I brought with me from school. When I notice that I've done that, I can come back to presence and I can reconnect with what's real. 
And this is what John and I want to bring to you all today, is the notion that we're not stuck with those old programmes. But they're not always easy to change, but they're easy to spot. And then we can be different in that moment and come back to presence. And I know that's something that John's going to be talking about as well. So, John, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you, Sarah. Um, briefly, uh, my name's John Britton. Uh, my encounter with the whole notion of boarding school survivors is even more recent, probably five years ago, uh, with a certain bullheadedness i ignored the reality of my life for quite a lot of decades until such time as i completely burnt out and crashed and all the rest of it and then thought of maybe i better do something about it um and part of doing something about it was looking back and trying to understand the past and and encountering this notion that boarding school was in fact recognized as a origin of trauma and yeah i found that really hard excuse me i'm not i don't have trauma i got i don't carry damage all of this stuff you know i i didn't want to recognize that in myself and when i did the doors opened I began to realize that things that were just how I am were in fact things that I had made. And that if I had made certain ways of behaving, I could make new ways of behaving. Easy to say, not easy to do, but possible. So my story as as when I look back on on my adolescence, I was sent away to boarding school at the age of nine or something like that. Um, and I was, you know, mine is a story of, of continually being an outsider. Um, first of all, my my uh, parents were both from working class backgrounds and I was a scholarship boy and I was uh, very arty, very noisy, very idiosyncratic. Somebody I look back on now and go, God, he was great, but I spent most of my life loathing him. Um but a, a funny, quirky, idiosyncratic boy sent off and intellectual. I got a scholarship, music scholarship and intellect, you know, academic scholarship. And I was sent away to a muscular Christian uh, rugby playing school with a very strong undercurrent of paedophilia. I, you know, I was an outsider. I didn't fit in. I absolutely was wrong for the culture of that school, which, you know, whatever they might have said, despised the intellectual and despised the artistic and really only liked kind of conventional boys who played rugby. But then I was an outsider because my dad was a teacher at that school, uh, not a popular teacher. He was very old when I was born. He was retiring when I was there and he was a grumpy old man. And every time he shouted at someone, they took it out on me. Also, my brother had been there and had not been popular either. He'd been there a few years earlier than me. Um, so I was an outsider because I was associated with the staff. And then I was an outsider because at the age of 13, overnight, for reasons I really still don't understand, everybody decided they hated me. And I started three years of, you know, high level bullying, physical, psychological, emotional bullying. Um, you know, I'd stand there at the end of every day, watch my dad get in the car and drive off home. And I wasn't allowed to go home. Uh, so I was an outsider to my own home. And then, of course, because by then we'd moved to live in a small Welsh village. If I did get home in the holidays, I was an outsider in the village because it was mainly farmers' children, uh, mainly Welsh speaking. And I was this posh English boy who didn't fit in. So it was a story of being an outsider. And, you know, when things really crashed and burned for me a few years ago, and I started looking back, I went that sense of myself as an outsider actually is a pervasive um, experience of my entire life. And when I wasn't an outsider in my life, I constructed a way of being an outsider. These are thought patterns and attitudinal patterns that I made, and I wasn't an idiot for making them. I made them to survive. And this, again, is at the heart of what we're doing here. We make things to survive but we continue to try to survive when the thing we were defending ourselves against has disappeared. And the process for me of these last few years has been very much about moving beyond those survival strategies 
and trying to take ownership of my life as it is now. So that's basically, you know, my strange potted story. Um, this idea, Sorrel, of you know the creation of survival strategies this the work that we've the conversations we've been having even before we started talking about working together when we were just having conversations you talk really clearly in terms of neural patterns patterns of making stories for ourselves which are survival strategies but are also connected to dreaming and creativity yes do you want to just talk into that a little bit more because i think it's really powerful so the neuroscience shows that all our experience is created by the mind and using and by the brain using exactly the same neural mechanisms, if you like, as we used to create dreams. So it's not as if we're passive recipients of what we're experiencing. We're creating our experience moment to moment. And, and part of that is the stories that we create the interpretations we place upon things, um, the thinking we engage in, the beliefs, the, even our emotions. Our emotions are largely expressed in the body. So, you know, if you feel fear, you might feel it in your chest area, for instance, or in your belly. But of course, your brain is giving you the information about what's ha happening in your body, just as if you're in pain. It's your brain that's constructing that experience of pain. So, and when you come back to the basic truth that all our experience is created by the mind and the brain, everything starts to look a little bit different. And actually, it gives you a sense of agency and control over what's happening in your life. And what, I think one of the things that you and I are really interested in, John, is, is the notion of moving out of being a victim into having sovereignty. Mm. That, you know, all the time we think we're in the victim, well, there's nothing we can do about that. We feel like we're at the mercy of what's outside of us. But once we realize that we have that control. Yes, I, I, for me, that's really true. I resist very strongly what is, you know, prevalent in, in some areas of talking about this, which is change your mindset or stop being a victim. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not, we, that's too easy. I also res resist the passivity of going, well, you just have to sit with the pain, sit with the experience, and eventually it'll go away. I don't believe that. I, 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 that doesn't feel right to me. You see, my professional background before the last five years, when I refocused into being a consultant and a coach, my professional background is training performers, initially actors and then dancers and improvisers. And then using the skills of training performers to work in corporate areas and so on. Because if you are learning to perform at a very deep level, you are learning how to shift consciously to shift and change the way you interact with the world authentically. Acting is not about faking. Acting is always absolutely real. You are really doing the thing that you're doing in front of the camera or in front of the audience. Acting is a real activity, like chopping wood. Your body does real things. Your voice does real things. It's practical. But you use your mind to change how you see and respond to the world. It takes work. It's called rehearsal in performance. We train and we rehearse. And because of that, we are able to be on stage or in front of a camera. And when the unexpected happens, we, cha we, perf we respond in character. We respond authentically and spontaneously. And I think this is a process which is profoundly powerful for us in our lives. We rehearse processes of change. We consciously go through deciding mm -hmm. how to change things. We, you know, rehearsals, people always, young actors always go, you know, oh, I'm scared of getting things wrong. And I go, for God's sake, rehearsal is where you're meant to get things wrong. Yes. <laughs> you know, get, things, get things right on stage, get them wrong yes. in rehearsal. Same in our personal change. As we go through process of, processes of personal change, there are going to be times where we go, yeah, that just didn't work. Mm. 
I tried something and I feel like crap. That's okay. Be in the safe space to do that because all change involves a certain amount of trial and error. You consciously try something and it either takes you a step forward or it doesn't make any difference or you go a step backwards. Whatever, it doesn't matter. You've learned something. And John, it gives you feedback as well, doesn't it? Totally. Absolutely. Um, And there's that thing about recognising that you've tried something and you didn't. Maybe it would have worked had you done it just a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And the feedback tells you, you just need to tweak it. Mm-hmm. Say, no, that was a really stupid idea. We'll try something totally different next time. And the feedback is the empowerment. Yes. Because you personal development mm-hmm. is not about someone telling you how to change. There are times for that. I mean, there are therapeutic processes where you have somebody say to you, just stop doing that and try doing this. You know, sometimes that's necessary. There are times in a rehearsal studio with a performer where I'll say, actually, just don't do it like that. It just doesn't work. But generally speaking, the real area of growth is when you try something and receive immediate feedback from yourself to yourself about what does and doesn't work and realize that you have the power to do things differently. You do not need permission from others to make healthy changes in your own life. They might think you know, that you need oh, permission. Yes. They might demand that you listen to them, but you don't actually need it. You need to have the ability to be empowered by your ability to respond to your own feedback processes. Absolutely. And I would say even taking a step, a step back into the past from that is that, ability, that, that recognition that you are the one who gives yourself permission. Yes. Before yeah. you even get to the point of saying, no, 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 sorry, your permission isn't required anymore. Mm. So absolutely. And and being open, but also being open to receiving constructive criticism, maybe, or, you know, gentle, kind feedback as opposed to nasty feedback, shall we say? Yeah, I mean, f- so much of my my work has been about training performers and I have found in in you know teaching, and I've also taught many. I, I run a program called the Teach Performance Program, which is training artists and teachers to teach performance better. Yes, I work from the basis that unconditional positive feedback, unconditional, not you did this well, but unconditional positive feedback is the most powerful learning mechanism there is. Mm-hmm. Because unconditional positive feedback, where you do something, Sorrel, and I go, yes, 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 it frees you from shame, from self-defense, from self-criticism, and allows you to decide for yourself the things that you want to do better. Rather than me shaping you to how I think you should be, I give you the space to shape yourself to how you want to be. Now, of course, there may be times where you're not in a relationship like this, but in a performance studio where there may be times where a performer is doing something which just doesn't work. Mm. Then you don't need feedback. Then you just need technical observation. Hello, I can't hear you. That's technical observation. It's not feedback. It's not criticism. It's just saying uh, this room is slightly bigger than you think it is. I can't hear you. Can okay. you be a bit louder? It's just technical. That that's all. So, so, so you might say technical feedback, but that's yes. yeah. So yes, that that creating of a space of unconditional personal growth, which for me is absolutely what was withdrawn when I went to boarding school. Where and actually, everything John, was a... everybody has been through this mm. that at some stage in our lives we were not given that unconditional love that unconditional um acceptance whatever mm. and sometimes we stopped thinking we were entitled to it and i think that's one of the big learnings for me is realizing actually i have an entitlement to unconditional love and acceptance mm. and i can even give it to myself 
you know, why ever not? And yet that for me was so radical and so new. And I only learned it about six months, maybe six months ago, I'm not sure. I mean, seriously, I'm 65 years old and here I'm suddenly finally realising this late stage of my life that this is something I can even do for myself. Ah, uh, you can't rush these things. No, you can't. Listen, we're coming towards the end. <laughs> yeah. We can get on to the next stage if we don't want to keep these people up all night. Absolutely. And we were going to, I think this is the point where we're going to get them to do a bit of work, isn't it? Yeah. It's all very well um, sitting there listening to things. I realised, actually, that when I did the welcome at the beginning, I missed something out that I wanted to say, which was that we're going to get you to do some journaling in a minute. And so if you don't have a paper and pencil, this might be a good time to go and get some so you can write stuff down. So I'm going to give you all, if, if anyone who needs to go look for a join, you're going to keep an eye on the galleries. Anybody heading out away from the, the device to go and look for paper and pen? Well, the majority of people have their cameras off, so I'm not entirely sure. But, <laughs> um, okay. That's good. So I'm just so, going to, uh, I'm just going to assume that everyone's ready. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're going to do the the way we're going to run this next little section of the work. I'm just going to do um, a short presencing exercise. Yeah. A short one. Uh, then Sorrel is going to set up an, a short exercise. I'm just going to comment on that exercise. And then you're going to do that exercise. All of this is very um, simple. Yes. The fact that things are simple uh, are quite important for me. And as we set up, as I set up a presencing exercise, I just want to sort of explain why. People sometimes because life can feel very complicated, we make processes of change very complicated because it's very difficult to be present sometimes. We make the idea of presence very complicated. None of these things are complicated. Doesn't mean they're easy to do, but none of them are complicated. And we're going to do a short presencing exercise and people get very caught up on going, oh, presence is one of those things. It's some kind of spiritual thing or I've got to quieten my mind and sit cross-legged in a monastery for six months. Presence is unbelievably simple. Presence is just being here. That's all. In fact, it's so simple. You can't actually be anywhere else. You are here. Presence is just connecting with reality. Presence is not something you have to achieve, because if there was a loud noise now, you would all be present. Presence is what we have when we stop distracting ourselves. Presence is our natural state, which we spend a large amount of our life distracting ourselves from. So when we do a basic presencing exercise, it's really simple. I'm simply going to encourage you to do a great deal less, to think a lot less, not to choose to get distracted, and instead just to connect to reality. And you know, one of the best ways of connecting with reality, and you can do this right now, is that you can choose to smile. Even if you don't feel like smiling, if you choose to smile, it actually brings you into a certain psychological connection with now. I'm smiling now. Whereas when you get lost in thoughts, you almost always go, mm -hmm. your face goes all into. Mm -hmm. Let yourself smile. Right now, there's nothing to worry about. You've got nothing to achieve. Nobody's going to suddenly demand anything of you or tell you off. You can just smile. And as you sit here or stand here and you, you maybe allow yourself to smile, maybe just have a little look around the space that you're in and not just look, but listen to the space you're in and maybe let yourself see it with a certain amount of surprise and wonder. Is everything familiar? Yeah, I'm looking at all the familiar things in this chaos of my well, temporary study, because my study is being rebuilt. So look around, look at the chaos. Remember to smile. Let yourself look around. Good God, it's messy in here. You feel the, the 
chair that you're sitting on. See, this place that you are right now, the here and now, this is, this is where we start. And this is where you're, you can return to at any point. At any point, if you start to feel uh, we're going into memories or whatever that I don't want to go into, you can just return to here. You look around and look at this funny study. Too many books. I must throw that away sometime. What's that sound? You can come back here right now. It's not difficult. And as you look around and you're smiling, we're just going to pay attention to breathing just for a moment. And I'm going to ask you to breathe in for a count of four and breathe out for a count of six. And this is about empowerment. The reason you breathe in for four and out for six is that when every, every single time you breathe in, you activate your sympathetic nervous system. That is a sort of ner part of your nervous system that encourages you to get ready for action. You go, you, if you're about to do something, you tend to go, right, because it activates the sympathetic nervous system. Every time you breathe out, you activate the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is that part of your system that causes you to relax. That's why when you finish a job, you tend to go. So looking around and listening and touching the table and whatever it is, smiling, breathe in for four to activate your system. Two, three, four, and then breathe out for six to relax. One, two, three. Four, five, six. And keep smiling. Breathe in, two, three, four. Hold it for a moment or two. And out, two, three, four, five, six. You're still here, still in your room, still smiling. Breathe in, two, three, or hold it for a moment or two, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. As you breathe in and out at your own pace, pay attention to making sure that you're just letting your shoulders relax. No need to hold any tension in your shoulders. The world won't collapse if you relax your shoulders. <laughs> in your own time, just breathing in, and the longer breath out, smiling, looking around, hearing the room, being here now. Touching base with the wonder of being alive right in this moment. Isn't it a miracle? Isn't it glorious? Right now, breathing in and out. Slow breath in, slower breath out. Looking around, letting yourself smile. And then when you come to the end of the next breath, just stop the structured breathing. Don't stop breathing, just stop the structured breathing. Look around. And know that in this moment, whatever's going to happen tomorrow or whatever happened yesterday, in this moment, it's okay. This is your place you can return to because this is the place that you live. It's called the here and now. And right now, here, everything's okay. Sorrel, do you want to introduce where we're going to go? Yeah, thank you for that, John. I feel really relaxed now. So the exercise is to think about something that you left behind in childhood that you would like to pick up again. And John is going to give us an example so you kind of get an idea of what this is all about. Yeah, I mentioned when I, when I was growing up, I was a noisy, arty, wild hair. I've still got wild hair, but I didn't care. And I remember when I went off to school, I, I managed to get into the main hall one evening and I sat at the grand piano and I played wildly. 
It was a terrible noise. But my God, it was exciting to me. I didn't care. And a teacher walked in and said, that's an awful noise. Stop it. And I learned that I should not do things that other people thought might be upsetting. I learned to conform. I've spent 30 years as an artist making theatre, and I look back on it and I think I did not achieve the things I could have achieved because I always tried in some ways to be conventional. I was pretty unconventional as an artist, but I never really explored the outer limits of what I could have done because I was always scared of somebody walking in and saying, stop it, that's horrible. Now that I'm, you know, a little older and no longer making art for my living, I'm working as a coach now, I'm composing music and I don't care if anyone else likes it. I want to pick up again that childlike sense of going, this is for me. This is my creativity. And I don't care if other people don't like it because other people aren't paying for it. This is me. That's what I want to pick up again, that absolute faith that what I do as an artist is worth doing because that's what I spent the whole of my life telling other people and I never told it to myself. That's what I want to pick up again, that childlike fearlessness. So what we want all of you to do now is to take your pen and your paper and spend just a couple of minutes journaling about what it is you would like to pick up that you left behind when you were a child and what it would bring you now in this in this part of your life and in the here and now. <laughs> 